You're watching Word on the Streets. We already showed you one side of Auburn Ave at the Big Bethel Community Center. Now let's take a look at the other side of Auburn Ave as we take a look at the Butler Street YMCA. You're watching Word on the Streets. The building was built in 1916, so the need for renovations is significant. Um, you can see our residents, they, they do whatever they can do to create home for themselves, you know? Obviously, Braves fan. Um, so, our rooms are to varying degrees like this. Some of them we just recently painted. This one hasn't been painted yet. That's why it's probably not occupied. But generally, they have a basic bed, a nightstand. Um, and they usually, you know, put up their own windows or blinds. But these are the sites, sort of projects that, you know, even if we get people to come in and just help paint or tear up carpet and lay down tile or right. help renovate a room, or, you know, things like that. Uh, very, very basic, simple things. But the overall need for this building is significant from a capital structure to investment because it is such an old building. Any given night, as we approach October and it's becoming winter, the need for for shelter becomes even that much more significant. So we'll have men knocking our doors down to get in here, to get in this building during the months of October, November, December, January, and February when it's coldest outside. Otherwise, they have a pretty quick option to just sleep on a corner or under under a bridge somewhere. So you got to understand that there's a seasonal pattern to this to this population in terms of their behavior and even the choices that they make. So when it's warmer, they may not even seek behavior. They may not seek help because they're okay with laying out on the street under a cover or under a bridge. But when it's cold and conditions are harsh, that's when they're more likely to engage and ask for and seek help and support. There's a corporate and business interest that says that yes, we want to make the city of Atlanta an attractive place for people to live. They want, it wants, they want it to be attractive and they want it to be safe. Okay, And so you look at the downtown environment, and historically, it has not been that, right? right. So why is that? And, and, and a lot of that is because there is an influx and a large amount of, homeless, of the homeless population that resides or hangs out in this area. So there are competing interests there, certainly. And so people say, well, you want to do this sort of program, you want to serve homeless, that's fine. Just NIMBY, not in my backyard, you can't do it. Because right. it affects me, right? right? It affects my property values, it affects my environment. And so if this is the population there, you know, it affects the economy. And so it, it doesn't become an attractive place to live. It doesn't become a place where investment is made for small business or businesses. So they are competing interests. So you have to say to yourself, okay, well, if they're not here, where are they gonna go? And what ends up happening is that you just displace them to different places of the community. Right. You might run them out of downtown, but I, I can assure you they're going to show up somewhere else. Right. And if you keep going, I assure you, if you if you push them hard enough and they will end up in Buckhead, we find real quick solutions to that. Right. So, you know, race, economy, class, all that plays a part in the political decisions that are made to provide the support necessary. The one thing that has to be done, though, is that there needs to be a comprehensive plan around how you provide funding and support services for the homelessness and what do those places need to look like. They right. should not be uh, shab towns. They should be, you know, nice looking environments where people feel a sense of pride about where they are and that they can coexist with hardworking taxpayers who can empathize with the needs of that population. Actually, it's nothing more than what has been going on throughout the likes of history. The Most of the programs cater toward women and children. But if you know your history, you know, I believe it was Willie Lynch who said that you know, the way to keep a slave is not to beat them, but to put black against white, black against light, male against female, um, and so on and so on, field against house. And that's what I think the government is still doing. Uh, there does not appear to be a great deal of services for black men.
and I am still from uh, a belief where the household starts with the man and it goes down from there and when you do that you help in destroying the black family and making sure that it doesn't get its foothold so that's some of the politics that I see uh, I think that most of the time what, what, what I also see is that people just are not willing to step up to the plate and you cannot be afraid to step up to the step up to the plate because but for the grace of God, it could be you, me, or anybody else on that street washing with, with a bucket. And that's one thing that I think keeps me grounded, realizing that if not for God, it could be me out there. So we do have our obligation to come and give back. Well, I understand the sensitivity among the philanthropic community to women and children. Right. Nobody wants to, the face of a woman and a child on the street is not a very pretty picture. And so there is a heightened sensitivity to the needs of women and children, and that's certainly understandable, which is why you have the situation with the increasing uh, homelessness among men. They often get overlooked, and, and they become a community or population that over time gets abandoned. Um, and so those resources get diverted. And so, so these men continue um, in this cycle and until you bring heightened awareness to the challenge, particularly in an economy like this, you know, where everyone is hit with the economy, our benefit, our supporters have been hit by the economy. So the dollars, the finite dollars that are available, they get squeezed and less become available for these types of programs and they get diverted towards other things that may be a priority. And so it's important to bring awareness to the community and to, to donors to say, look, this is a population that needs support. And with the right type of support, these men can be productive citizens, paying taxes, taking care of their children, and on the right path towards success. But it requires an investment in the same way that you make an investment in any other population of people. And you have to stay committed to that population. They will have setbacks, they will have challenges, especially when you're dealing with men who have dual diagnosis and uh, alcoholism and drug abuse. There are gonna be setbacks along the way and that's expected and that will be anticipated, but you gotta stay committed to their overall success. And so we really try to work with um, the community by educating them first about what it is we do here and how we do it and the unique needs of the population we serve. The second thing uh, that we try to do is we work with other agencies do collaborative state grants where, for example, we worked recently uh, with the Fulton Atlanta, um, with an agency here in Fulton, Atlanta that was a benefactor of ARA Fund. ARA is the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Okay. So, you know, yeah. there's this notion that when that legislation was passed, that it wasn't doing anything for the economy. Well, I beg to differ. Through those types of funds, what's able to happen? We're able to house 25 men off of that grant right. and provide them a stipend where they don't have to pay for their housing. It gets supplemented, and so they have a place to stay. And if they're working, those dollars that they earn to work can be applied to helping them seek independent living. Um, it also employs people. Those ARA right. funds are responsible for hiring case managers and, 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 and hiring the employees necessary to, necessary to support this population. So while it may not have trickled down into the capital structure of our economy, it certainly trickled into the social and human service sector of our economy where the greatest need exists among the populations that are most vulnerable. Many nights I've been here and I've seen brothers um, across the street uh, you see the glass pipes being fired up and I couldn't quite understand in the beginning but then I realized that sometimes you do whatever you can to take the pain away so there is a compassionate piece there but I've spoken to a number of brothers because you see it every day and the only way that you cannot see it is if you close your eyes and close your ears to it um, the brothers that I have spoken to you know I try to encourage them let them know that because I, I think the biggest challenge that has to be done first, you know, we, we, we talked about feeding and clothing and housing, but none of that does any good until you get their minds right. You have to make them know that they are valuable in society and they do have net worth. And then once you get that, then everything else is um, fundamental. And then at that point, we can say that we have taught them to fish as opposed to giving them a fish for a meal. We'd like to take this time to thank you for watching Word on the Streets. 
Stay tuned as we show you the streets of New York City, Los Angeles, DC, and Detroit. You're watching Word on the Streets.